Every year, there are films that seep through the cracks and become lost to general audiences, failing to garner the widespread attention that films of their quality deserve. Examples from 2019 are Under the Silver Lake and Dark Waters, 2018 gave us First Reformed, Annihilation, and Burning. In the year 2020, Swallow has become that forgotten film, and through the month of October, I can confidently call Swallow my favorite film of the year. So let's talk about it. It follows a young woman named Hunter and her layered struggles, most notably with pica, a disorder characterized by compulsions to eat objects with little to no nutritional value. In recent times, what general audiences expect from horror and thriller films has changed. Franchises like Paranormal Activity, The Conjuring, and The Purge have redefined the genre. Jump scares in ungrounded paranormal settings are what is popular. And while I've had many great experiences with these types of movies, a personal favorite of mine being Sinister, the slower and more physical horror that classics like John Carpenter's The Thing and David Cronenberg's Videodrome are notorious for is a great change of pace. And in Swallow that bodily horror popularized in the 80s is present, albeit in its own unique way. If you've seen the film, or even just clips from the movie, the physical and bodily horror elements don't need much explanation. Watching Hunter consume objects such as marbles, pins, and the like is sensationally disturbing. It immediately puts you in a vicarious state, imagining the harm and the pain the object could be causing to the inside of her body. And when you start to consider the setting of the story and the demographics of our characters, it becomes even scarier. The thing takes place in a remote outpost in the harsh weather of Antarctica. Its setting is hardly conventional relative to everyday life, not to mention the monster from space. And while Videodrome is more grounded in where it takes place, it's not so grounded in its surrealist and hallucinogenic story. What stands out about Swallow relative to these two films is its real-world feel. The film opens to seemingly normal upper-class individuals doing normal things. Everything about Swallow seems rather conventional, to the point where if you were watching it without any context, you may not even expect it to be a horror thriller at all. The story, setting, and characters feel like they take place in our world, even if you can't relate specifically to them. So what subsequently follows, at least to me, becomes all the more chilling. And if you were to focus on just these elements, Swallow is disturbing enough. However, to me what makes the film so great is how it uses the physical horror and thriller elements to reveal the true horror of the story. While listening to their inspiration for the film, first-time director Carlo Marabella Davis, who also wrote the screenplay, references his grandmother. He shares that she was a housewife in the 1950s that developed ritualistic coping techniques, like excessive hand-washing, over the course of an unhappy marriage. Marabella Davis goes on to describe how she was eventually institutionalized by her husband and even lobotomized for her compulsions. Knowing this, the earlier settings in the film begin to make a lot of sense. Hunter's character plays as a token of the 1950s era American woman. Her demeanor is submissive, living as a homemaker seeking to please her husband. Even her attire reflects this. She can be seen wearing colorful outfits, specifically dresses. Her role is to remain home and take care of the house while he goes to work to make a living for them. Now on its surface, there isn't anything inherently wrong with a traditionalized domestic relationship. However, when you begin to look at how Hunter is treated by her husband and his parents, the glossy and idealized glow that the relationship may initially convey begins to break down. Every character's true self starts to show. Richie, Hunter's husband, is short-tempered and neglectful. He fails to provide her the care and understanding that healthy relationships have, instead defaulting to outbursts that transcend into emotional abuse. Hunter doesn't seem to be his main priority, and work is always taking precedent. These toxic traits are true of Richie's parents as well. In an early scene, Hunter is trying to tell a story and is rudely interrupted by Richie's father to begin speaking with Richie. In a scene shortly thereafter, Richie's mother suggests to Hunter that she grow her hair out because Richie loves women with beautiful, long hair. And it's no coincidence that what follows those two scenes is our first exposure to Hunter's compulsion, manifesting itself to the degree where she is compelled to eat a marble. The sequence is slow and methodical. She slowly opens the glass box and retrieves the object, staring at it with a look of intrigued innocence. And when she finally puts it in her mouth and swallows, she smiles in satisfaction. This action is cathartic for her. Now early on in the film we learn that Hunter is pregnant, and this plays an important role later in the story. As time passes and the objects that Hunter consumes evolves, as an audience member your fears for Hunter's health grows, and you begin asking questions about how it may be affecting her pregnancy. These fears reach a peak when Hunter and Richie attend a scheduled ultrasound, and Hunter's secret becomes secret no more. She is rushed to emergency surgery where the objects she had been consuming are removed. It's from here that the direction of the story changes, and the controlling nature of those around her only increase. Richie and his parents take a new interest in her, but that interest doesn't seem to come from a place of compassion, understanding, and care for Hunter's well-being specifically. Their concern for Hunter's condition seems to only extend as far as her pregnancy. 
They want her to get better for the sake of the baby and to ensure that the vessel by which their legacy will continue isn't ruined, not because they truly care about Hunter as a person and the tribulations she's experienced. Richie even suggests this when he says to Hunter that her disorder is something you are supposed to tell someone about before you get married, implying that if they were already married, it would be a deal breaker for the relationship and the ironic nature of his abusive behavior is completely lost on him. He and his family are acting in a manner of patriarchal control and have been throughout the duration of the film, and this abuse only exacerbates Hunter's anxieties and insecurities where she faults herself and subsequently seeks out approval and validation from those same people that abuse her. It's a vicious cycle that both parties are oblivious to. Now just as a warning, I'm going to be getting into a couple of plot details that are relevant to my overall thoughts about the film. If you'd like to avoid those, skip to this point in the video. However, understand that subsequent analysis is relevant to these events. Now as a result of their discovery, Richie and his parents decide that it's best she attend therapy as well as be watched by personal aid at all times. She is reluctant to do both but goes on to accept as if she really had a choice. Though she is reluctant to share, we learn through the therapy sessions that Hunter's biological father actually raped her mother and that's how her mother became pregnant with her. This is a very heavy detail, and Hunter's demeanor when she shares it is very calm, though it's obvious that it's a detail she has yet to really accept, even if she says otherwise. She says so as a method of avoidance and repression, and later when a prying and manipulative Richie is talking to the therapist on the phone, she tells Richie that Hunter has things in her past she needs to overcome and that Hunter won't be able to without his love and acceptance. And instead of fixating on that and respecting patient confidentiality, he forcefully requests that she tell him what happened in her past. The therapist gives in, and it's at this moment that Hunter's waiting outside the door and overhears. This causes Hunter to experience an anxiety attack, where she eventually is able to slip away from her aid and swallow a large nail. She's later found by the aide lying on the ground choking. He had fallen asleep beside her trying to calm her down. Hunter is then taken to the hospital, where she has a nail removed. It's after this that Richie and his parents have a meeting with Hunter to inform her she must be taken to an inpatient facility for treatment. Hunter tries to downplay the incident as a game and that it's not necessary she go. Richie's father then threatens her with an ultimatum. If she doesn't go, Richie will divorce her. She is told to quickly go pack some things as they are set to take her immediately. With the help of the personal aide who is the only character in this film that shows any degree of real sympathy and understanding towards her, Hunter is able to escape and run away. Later that evening, Hunter talks to Richie on the phone where he tries to manipulate her into coming back, but Hunter is able to see through him and refuses. After more verbal abuse mitigating her existence and exclaiming that he will hunt her down, Hunter says, okay, and hangs up the phone. It's in this moment, finally separated from those that abused her, that Hunter is able to break the abusive and controlling cycle she was in and start healing. She decides to find her biological father and confront him. In a scene that is incredibly tense and wonderfully performed by Haley Bennett, who by the way is outstanding throughout the entire duration of this film, we finally see Hunter take control of her own life in an assertive and therapeutic manner. Hunter's father tells her that he is ashamed of what he did, but not of her, and that Hunter is not like him, word she has been waiting to hear her entire life. Hunter was living a life where she seemingly didn't have a lot of control. She felt at the behest of others and was always acting in a way to please them, rather than herself. However, her secret and taboo act provided her with a sense of peace and authority over her own life. She lived in an environment that was controlled and dictated by others, specifically men, but in those moments it was just her. And while you yourself may not go as far as she did in the film, as an audience member you still empathized with her and the restrictions she endured. Now because film is a subjective medium, others may see it differently. Some will identify her compulsions as what was traumatizing her life, and considering Pika as a clinically diagnosable disorder, you wouldn't be faulted for initially seeing it in that way. However, disorders such as this one are much more complex than that, and are generally a result of external reasons and trauma. While her Pika disorder did cause her harm, it was a manifestation of unresolved trauma from her childhood and emotional abuse and neglect she was experiencing in her home life. And in the end, it was her disorder that actually led her to confront and overcome those problems. What also makes Swallow so great art's fascinating technical and cinematic details. Most of the cinematography in the first half of the movie was done with a fixed camera, producing medium shots with frames that are straight and perpendicular and have little to no movement at all. This pairs well with the calm and high class persona that Richie and his family give off, with the large upper class home, job, and lifestyle. It could also be interpreted as a facade for Hunter's mental state. She puts up a front to please others and hide her true feelings. This is in stark contrast to sequences where Hunter is alone and we focus on her relationship with the objects. The depth of field becomes shallow, almost as if she is entering her own hypnotic world, and the camera movement turns more dynamic and chaotic, representing her headspace when giving in to her compulsions. Carlo Mirabello Davis and his cinematographer Caitlin Arismendi even shot with specific lenses in these scenes as they were good at capturing the texture of the objects, and those diagnosed with pica have often described craving an object because of its texture. 
Also, in scenes where Hunter is present among other people, especially men, she's rarely the primary focus of the frame. A masculine figure is often brooding over the shot, or Hunter is lost in the sequence altogether. And this connects back with the patriarchal themes the film explores. It's also worth noting that the crew is made up of mostly women. This is a progressive decision, especially coming from someone who identifies as a man. Mirabello Davis mentioned how he didn't want his masculine perspective to distort the story. He was concerned with potentially depicting Hunter as more of a sexual object rather than a true human being, even if that depiction was subliminal and unintentional. And I see that decision as incredibly courageous and intelligent, and it only improves the quality of the film. The last shot of the movie we see Hunter in the bathroom after she has experienced what I can only imagine was an incredibly difficult and harrowing but very freeing decision. At first she looks nervous and lost, but then begins to smile and leaves the bathroom. And from there the shot continues into the credits as we watch other women do the same. This may be my favorite sequence of the film. While we see a conclusion to Hunter's narrative, it's almost like the film doesn't conclude at all. It works as a way to transition this project from a story to something that is much more reflective of real life. Women across the country and the world continue to endure varying degrees of discrimination, both explicit and subliminal. They are expected to look and dress in certain ways, act in certain manners, and work and do more to attain the same recognition. Women are expected to be perfect. And it's the horrors of these perfections that Swallow depicts so well. Thanks for watching.